What does it mean to be truly open, transparent, and honest? Well, when it means discovering you are polyamorous, there may be many challenges, surprises, endings, and changes that come. In this new episode, Terry Fernandez, clinical psychologist in Austin, Texas, talks about the journey in discovering that she's polyamorous at heart, while also being compassionate in a monogamous marriage. Hello and welcome. You're listening to the Embody Podcast, a show about remembering and embodying your true nature, inner wisdom, embodied healing, and self-love. My name is Candace Wu, and I'm a holistic healing facilitator, intuitive coach, and artist sharing my personal journey of vulnerability, offering meditations and guided healing support, and having co-creative conversations with healers and wellness practitioners from all over the world. This episode is sponsored by the Monthly Embodied Healing Group, which is a continual group, small group that happens once a month, supporting you in feeling more embodied, like yourself, and offering love and forgiveness and compassion in an embodied way so that real change can happen in your life and in how you feel about yourself and the world around you. You can find that along with other ways to support the Embody podcast at candacewu.com slash support. Welcome back everyone to the Embody podcast. So I know that I said I would be on a hiatus at some point. Uh, yeah, that was like six weeks ago. And I did do a rerun episode or two, but since then it's been all new episodes. Uh, I guess coronavirus um, 19 has been very interesting for many people and me as well. So I just felt compelled to continue. But this episode is one that Terry and I recorded before that all began. In fact, it it was recorded before I even left for Mexico. So end of January. And I'm really excited to share this with you today. Polyamory is a topic that I've been very interested in for several years. And what I didn't know then that I know now is that I am polyamorous and that it slowly revealed itself over time that my curiosity was because it gave me a language set and um, a way of knowing and being that really made sense to me. And I was thrilled to find out that Terry and I related on this topic and we just talked up a storm on Instagram one day and I was excited to invite her to the show. Terry and I trained at the Illinois School of Professional Psychology together, and she studied forensic psychology and is now working with veterans in a trauma-informed and compassionate way, treating PTSD with, with veterans in Austin, Texas. And she's a native Texan, reformed gamer, wannabe lichenologist. And uh, after studying and living in Chicago, as well as in Kansas City and Gainesville, Florida, she decided to return to her hometown. I've always admired Terry in the way that she is truly compassionate to all people. And if she's not, she tries to be, and she looks at herself and identifies um, where in her thinking or in her heart is the discrepancy between her and being able to see someone or appreciate them or embrace them. She's one of the most authentic people I know, and she's also very, very funny. So here in this episode, we're talking about what it means to really be open and honest in yourself and to, if you really do become open and transparent in who you are, and what do you find? And when it means discovering you are polyamorous, there are challenges and surprises and um, deaths even, not human deaths, at least in, in her case or my case, but deaths of things and ways of being that you've known. Here in this episode, we also talk about the pressures of society and of past generations, partner reactions to new discoveries what life would be like if polyamory were always an option and not stigmatized, if it were something more in the open, um, growing up at least, or before now. 
We also talk about repression as a superpower and emotional cheating. What was emotional cheating and what is polyamorous and all sorts of other things, stories of grad school along the way. So I hope you find this episode stimulating and interesting for you. Be sure also to check out Terry's meditation and experiential that is to follow. And she offers a deep breathing, gentle body scanning, and progressive tension and relaxation to open your awareness and allow your awareness to rest in your body, as well as take inventory of how you're feeling and noticing where your mind goes. And of course, if you want to find that and not wait until later this week, you can find it directly on my website at candicewoo.com slash Terry, T-E-R-R-I. Okay, so without further ado, let's welcome Terry. So I have a cup of green tea with oat milk and honey. It's like (laughs) my favorite in the morning, and I'm just really ready to talk all things Terry polyamory and whatever comes up here. Wonderful. Yes. How are you doing? Mm -hmm. I am doing okay. Um, It's funny whenever I'm asked that or whenever I ask that of myself, it's just uh, knowing that this has been just a roller coaster and there are times where I'm up and down and then just coasting. And I feel Mm -hmm. like today I'm coasting. Mm-hmm. I mean, I think that's like yeah. what it's like to be human, right? <laughs> the ups and downs. Right. And like, <laughs> some days you're like, oh, right, I'm taking the ride. <laughs> it's a nice ride. Right. Uh, it's a nice ride or, hey, I'm really handling these curves right. pretty well. And then other times it's like, well, that was a right. detour. <laughs> yeah. Or like, crap, yeah. what was that? <laughs> that came out of nowhere. <laughs> seriously it feels like a dream yes. that i've had <laughs> yeah that's <laughs> a really good like... way of putting it um it's funny i i was at a uh just a store uh and you know how they always have the overhead music playing and i think it was the talking heads that one of their songs mm-hmm. um i don't even remember the name of the, the actual song but it, there's a line that says you know how did I get here? <laughs> and and my mind just picked up on that part. And I was like, yeah, how did I get here? And then just kind of <laughs> thinking back of how quickly life goes, but just how quickly <laughs> even these past, you know, several months have been. It's, it's uh, breathtaking in a lot of ways. It's so funny when, when songs like one line just really catches us and it's the right one and it oh. clicks. It's, it just kind of festers in a way. Right. Exactly. And, it, it, you know, and sometimes it's songs that we've heard of for years, never really paid a mu- any mind to, or um, what I have found is songs having just evolved in meaning from when I first heard them to when I've enjoyed them through the years. And then now it's like, wow, it's almost as if it's slowly unfolding into different ways. I'm now viewing it through the lens that I'm seeing today. Mm-hmm. I, mm-hmm. I've noticed that a lot today. Yeah. You know, I noticed that too in kind of just like everyday wisdom Mm -hmm. where something doesn't, you know, it's like your mind knows that phrase or someone's told you that or you know it like this certain, I can't even think of an example right now, but then it's a simple thing. And then when you hear it in the right moment, it's like, oh, oh, Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) like it reaches somewhere else in you or it somehow registers Right. right in the place it needs to from where you're needing it or something. And yeah, I love that feeling. Except it also to the mind is like, well, you knew that, but no, (laughs) you didn't. (laughs) It's like, I may have heard the words, but I didn't understand it or it didn't resonate within me. It didn't, like you said, click something. Mm -hmm. There's actually this lyric that I love from one of my favorite bands where um, the lyric is, uh, you know, it's not our fault. We were born too late. And you know, on one hand, I can, I, it's against the establishment, it's against the system of, and authority. Um, but at the same time, I've interpreted it in a way of, you know, we can't blame ourselves for just knowing what we do now. Um, you know, things unfold themselves to when we oh. need, when we need to know them, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. So it's not our fault that we just learn of things now, or we just come to that realization, kind of how I've interpreted that line now over the years 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like that a lot. What song is that? Um, it's called So What? It's by a band called Ministry. Um, and it's very <laughs> um, anti-authority, anti-establishment. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that what this conversation today is about anyway? <laughs> In a, you know... <laughs> pretty pretty much in a way and it's basically saying just so what like so what to everything you taught me everything you that I know just so what and then that line just comes up you know it's not our fault we were born too late and it's coming from the sentiment of um, older generations telling us what we're doing wrong or what's gone wrong and it's like yeah but <laughs> like this is our lot in life yeah. <laughs> I like that a lot. Um, oh, it feels it feels yeah, really yeah, it's really great. it feels really releasing of just stuff I didn't even know was there about about that. You know, like the mm -hmm. the pressure we put on ourselves or the shame. Yeah, that um, it can just it's just not necessary, but we take it on. Yeah, yeah, take on so much, and and you're right. There's so much pressure and shame involved. Um, more so than I had ever imagined. Um, yeah, it's been overwhelming, just disorienting, but, but also coming from places where I did not even realize, uh, both externally and internally. And so it's been, it's been quite the journey <laughs> to say the least. Mm, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And would you say that's like been more recent or just you mean over your lifetime? Yeah, I would say definitely more recent in the sense of um, kind of, I think of life right now, kind of post, uh, pre and post grad school <laughs> in a lot of ways. Yeah. Which is pretty much, you know, the last time you and I really saw each other, grad school. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. It was grad school. <laughs> the last time it's happened already. I know. And you were studying forensic psych, right? Yes. Yes. Okay. That's that is still my concentration. And then um, my internship year was kind of the pivotal year of deciding, am I going to specialize in forensics? And, you know, because my site was going to prepare me to be a forensic examiner and get certified by the end. Um, if I did the postdoc there, or do I dive into this wonderful new theory that my supervisor had, which was dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT, mm. and I fell in love with therapy. And um, from that point on, I have kind of done this hybrid and been more of a generalist than anything else. But um, yeah, my trajectory in grad school was I'm going to be a forensic examiner. I'm working with um, offenders. I'm going to work in corrections. Or in some facet with law enforcement and um, not going to do these touchy-feely things. <laughs> 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 if I can help it. Um, I even spoke to, um, oh, I forget her name. The the woman in training department whom we could never email or call. <laughs> we couldn't. Uh, uh, Tyler Shippen. Not, not. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> her, our friend Tyler yeah, Shippen. <laughs> I remember the body of her emails at the bottom is like, don't, basically like, don't contact me, don't email me, don't call me. <laughs> <laughs> I do. <laughs> like, well, how do I talk to you? You don't. Oh, I gotcha. <laughs> you just don't. Yes, you exactly. just don't. That's the rule. That's why I wrote this. <laughs> That's the setup. <laughs> but I remember being in her office once and, uh, I remember begging her, like, is there any way to get out of the therapy practicum? <laughs> like, I'll do double diagnostic. I'll do, <laughs> I'll do whatever I can. <laughs> you did not. You were trying to, like, keep, like, five exactly. months between you and the and touchy the, feely. <laughs> exactly. You're like, can I be you, Tyler, about therapy? Like, just don't talk to me. <laughs> This is not my thing. <laughs> yeah, so I definitely <laughs> took a detour. So, yeah, this is, it reminds me of grad school in the sense where pre grad school was just naive to so many things um, about myself and the world. Grad school just being like, you know, a dump in cold water of, hey, this is reality. And guess what? <laughs> You're going to get a very healthy dose of it. Um, 
And just that self-exploration that they don't put in the brochures. You know, I thought I was just going to go for a higher education. I didn't know it was really diving into a lot of rooms and cobwebs that I didn't even know existed within my mind. But that's kind of been this poly journey too. It's, it's very akin to that experience where I did not expect it. Wow. So what, when you say your poly journey, what, what happened in the beginning where you're, where you realized or started to open that up? Right. So I feel like, um, it's, it's been very much haphazard. Um, and actually what pops into my mind is they, uh, you know, they have so many viral videos and memes of pandas online and the one that's just tumbling <laughs> down the hillside <laughs> and like slowly gets back up. Like I meant to do that. That's kind of been experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, they look so right. happy go lucky too, you know. They're they get to the bottom uh, and they're like yeah. the Dalai Lama and they're like, yep. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe a little dumbfounded. A little bit. A little jostled. But um as I've been unpacking a lot of things, um and just being willing to explore, you know, what stuff has come up, I I've realized um that I've always had this sense of being different within my relationship. Um, and the way that it came about, it was very much a horrible timing. Um, I had just gotten married with my uh, husband. We had been together for 17 years and finally got married because of a lot of different life circumstances that had delayed our, our, our marriage. And the day afterward, um, hanging out with some friends and um, was hanging out with one of my long, long time friends um, of 17 years. Actually, I knew him uh, around the same time that I met my husband. And so we've all been friends half our lives, you know, do the math, 34. And so mm -hmm. yeah, through ill-advised, just you know, an intoxicated state, um, you know, he had disclosed that he, he loved me and he's loved me for a while. And I came to this realization I, that I've loved him too. And not in love in that sense, but just had this capacity of just being loving towards him for, for years and not realizing that at all. Um, and having that realization to myself, like, oh, that's what that feeling is. Uh, of just having this sense of mm -hmm. relief and really clarity. Um, and afterwards we, we sobered up, we went to a cafe and talked for about five hours about it, um, about what this meant for our friendship, what this meant going forward. You know, what do we do with this newfound knowledge? And I immediately was like, well, I'm going to go talk to my therapist. <laughs> <laughs> I have her on standby now. <laughs> <laughs> phone a friend perfect right. yep. um, <laughs> in fact I can get her right now <laughs> exactly right you know, you know what let's just go to her office <laughs> we'll wait <laughs> oh how funny yeah we'll uber um, and through you know after that you know having all of these very confusing feelings and thoughts and realizations prior to this yeah, there was is a very platonic and even a strained uh, friendship for for many years for many different reasons, and just knowing my husband had always said over the years, you know, there's just something about you two that's that's different. You, you guys have like he's and he would always say like I don't know, there's just something between you two. I and mean, he's like I don't I don't get it. He's like I, I, it's nothing wrong or bad. He's like I don't know, you guys just mm -hmm. act weird around each other, and it was very unconscious in many ways. And what I've realized through therapy is um, I have a knack for repression. <laughs> like, like for repression. Uh, oh, like <laughs> seriously. Uh, I've, I had no idea that. Well, you're really good I'm, at it. I'm so good. <laughs> you know, something. I am so good at this. Like I didn't realize. Give yourself some credit, Terry. You know? <laughs> right? It's my superpower. So... <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> uh, it's just it just comes naturally. I mean, all of us, though. That's <laughs> yeah. We all are. I mean, there's oh my gosh, how many millions of layers 
of repression yes. over centuries of life and right. lineage, you know, we can't possibly uncover it and no. unearth it all and know it all. <laughs> well, and it's, I'd like to think we can. <laughs> Oh, I think I think it's possible, but there's so many both mm-hmm. conscious and unconscious roadblocks. And it kind of goes back to those lyrics of, you know, it's not our fault. We're born too late because mm-hmm. you know, it's, I, in a lot of ways, it's like it's not my fault that you know my mind has kept this hidden from me for so long. Um, and a little background of that is like when I say repression, I mean, in the truest sense that this is completely unconscious where I, I would have memories um, resurfacing where I had some completely forgotten and my husband did not and was shocked that I don't didn't remember blocks of time um and I think a lot of it has to do with the culture that I grew up in you know a very strict Roman Catholic family um which you know I totally embody now (laughs) if you look at me (laughs) um (laughs) you know piercings and different colored hair you were like the model <laughs> the model oh, very much Catholic, so. right <laughs> oh yes um but you know my life up until I was a teenager I went to mass every single day multiple times during the day um both willingly and not <laughs> um prayed the rosary wore the veils mm-hmm. wore long skirts uh you know sleeves to the wrist very much modest and up until age 14, 15, I was seriously um, looking into taking the vows and entering a convent. And yeah, I was deep. Wow. I was deep within it. I had no idea. That's fascinating. <laughs> yes. and, and, yeah, I think of me in grad school. It's like, she was going to be a nun? Oh, yes. Yes, Terry was. <laughs> I um, know. Yeah. Wow. But what made it, what puberty. made you turn around? Or- <laughs> Okay. Puberty, okay. puberty hit. Um, <laughs> you can't ignore that. Cannot ignore that. And it's also um, a lot of just changes that were happening within the family, um, things that were happening within the, the Catholic Church itself, especially with all the scandals uh, and the sexual abuse that was happening, that I started to really question um, just my worldview and everything. And Along that lines, that's when I had also met my husband. I had met my, my friend of these many years. And I was just a very rigid thinking person. Very much so. Um, things were very black and white. Um, and I, I realize in a lot of ways that may have suppressed and repressed a lot of feelings of I don't think I loved Bren in that sense back then, um, but I think that the realization of I, I am capable of loving more than one person was definitely a door that was shut. And through this journey, even my husband has said, you know, what if you've always had this capability? What if before we met, before we started dating, you know, if Polly were an option, you know, would that be your path? He's like, but given the way things turned out, you, know, you shut that door. Like when we started dating, it was like, nope, this is my one and only, even if we're just boyfriend and girl- girlfriend, <laughs> um, just this very conservative, traditional, rigid way of thinking. And he's like, well, what if that door was mm-hmm. slightly open then, but when you closed it, he was still inside. Like you, you were able to let him in and me in. But then after that, um, you know, once we were together, that was it, nothing else. Um, and I'm trying to explore that a little bit more in just terms of the difference between, in my mind, how I see polyamory as being this ability and concept versus polyamory as the practice in relationships, um, if that makes a little sense. Yeah, I I think I'm getting you because that's something I'm sorting out as well. And I think you and I just briefly talked about this, like what is choice and what's not right? as part of that? Like what is our capacity to um, be open to acknowledging and feeling certain experiences, certain um, feelings in different relationships versus, or not versus, but then a second piece to that being how do you how do you mm-hmm. set up your life right. and your relationships? Yeah, and I think that um, 
that's a very good way of putting it because, you know, I believe that we're all, we're all capable of, of loving people in various ways, um, in multiple ways. And the acknowledgement and recognition of that, I think, in my experience has been very colored and restrained by, by culture, by society, by family, by, um, your own ethics and morality, um, situations even uh, that there are a lot of dynamics that are in place that just once you're starting the journey it, it's a lot to unpack um and a lot to try and understand and see how you fit into it um but but essentially it's trying to not make sense of the feeling but just see how that feeling um resonates in in, in your life and in your relationships what are some of those dynamics or challenges, things that you've unpacked that may have surprised you or just you didn't know was there along this journey? Right. Um, let me see. Because there's so many. <laughs> and they're just flying around I know, everywhere. Have you, yeah. yeah, just start, start somewhere. Right. Um, <laughs> right. Start anywhere. Right. There's. It's a million things. It's so complex. It, it, it is. And that's kind of the, the idea of it, too. You know, in concept, it's very complex. It's extremely complex. And um, you know, before, I, before I pull anything from what I've experienced, um, one thing that is kind of popping into my mind is, um, you know, kind of the encouragement and um, affirmations that I'll see online, especially from poly groups, because I'm trying to understand and um, interact with the community. But there's this sentiment that is often shared is, you know, if you're considering polyamory, like don't dip your toe in. Um, like this isn't something to just experiment with and just to say, hey, let's try this out or let's spice up the relationship. That This is a very intimate and serious and just world changing process that, you know, doing a toe in, it's not giving you the opportunity to fully understand yourself and others um, in your life. Um, but it's definitely not for the, <laughs> for the weak hearted, I would say. Um, and that's something that I've really noticed is um, mm -hmm. it's brought up a lot of insecurities that I didn't realize were there or were not an issue at one point, but got stirred up and have come to the forefront. Um, it's brought up a lot of needing to practice very healthy boundaries of your own growth, pacing um, yourself, not comparing um your growth to someone else's growth or to help theirs. Um, mm -hmm. Just acknowledging a, a lot of unspoken expectations of even friendships um, while trying to unpack and go through this process and journey that not a lot of people understand. Um, and we'll be pretty overt about it. Um, and some pretty passive as well. And so this isn't, it hasn't been, at least for me, a process that, has been a very supportive one. Um, I know that there have been folks who are in the poly community, but and also f other friends who poly that have had really great and wonderful, supportive and loving experiences. Yes, it's marked with um, difficulty and, and you know pain and, and, and the the pain of growth as well. Um, but for me, it's been it's been pretty difficult. And not to say that it hasn't been rewarding in any way, but it's definitely taken my breath away in many ways. And just unpacking things I didn't know I had to unpack. <laughs> you know, it's, it's mm -hmm. like, man, that there's another door. <laughs> well, I have so many to go through. Um, yeah. Let me pace myself. Right. When you said not for the weak hearted, I really, I was like, yep. <laughs> that... Absolutely. And, you know, the complexity that we're talking about, right. it really, for me, feels like the question of how much complexity are we able to hold? Right. And I know that that's been a question that for us has been there in grad school through like some of our group processing. It's like, how much complexity can this group or you hold? Can, can we actually acknowledge 
this feeling and that feeling and not dismiss it or try to squash it or cancel it out? Can we see that this is going on and it's uncomfortable for you? Can, how much can you hold? And I feel like that's this process. It is. And there are some days where it's like, yeah, I can, I can hold this. I can not contain it, but I can just be present with whatever is coming up. Um, I can feel and you know, ride the waves. And then other days it's like, oh my God, I can't, you know, I can't imagine taking one more step without it just crushing me, um, just the weight of it all. Um, and then, you know, not trying to slip into mm-hmm. to therapy mode of, okay, you know, notice that thought. <laughs> you know, is that a true thought? Is it a helpful thought? You know, it's not a real mm-hmm. thought because you're not being crushed. Um, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, let's act our way out of this you know, situation or CBT our way out of this mm-hmm. bag as opposed to, you know, I have a right to feel this way and, and I feel this way nonetheless. And, you know, am I willing to be present? Um and not use my superhero power of repression, <laughs> which, <laughs> which uh, no longer is working. Um, you know, it's, <laughs> it's very, um, you know, it reminds me of the, uh, ha- are you familiar with Plato's allegory of the cave? Yeah, a little bit. I, I, I always forget it, but then if you, if you tell me it, I'm like, oh yeah, right. Oh yes. Um, where a close enough version or even a briefer version of that, because it's been a while since I've read it, but, you know, there are folks in a cave that are chained and um, they only see shadows that I cast on the wall. And to them, that's reality. That's the only thing that they know. Um, but they're only projections, projections of reality, which makes a lot of sense for us. Because we, you know, we project a lot of our realities onto others and situations based on experiences. And somehow one of the cave dwellers escapes and gets out of the cave and sees reality, sees the sun, sees things that aren't projected. And he's so excited, so elated, you know, can't wait to tell folks back home (laughs) the good news. Um, And he does, and they don't believe Mm -hmm. him. Um, They think he's crazy. Mm -hmm. And um, somehow, I'm missing all the details, but somehow they kill him. (laughs) And... This has often been used as a representative of those who are enlightened and try to change the system or change the world, you know, must be put down, whether it's uh, biblical, you know, Jesus, if it's Muhammad, if it's Martin Luther King, if it's anyone who tries to change um, how, you know, the status quo, you know, they're, they're a disruptor. And, you know, the system or the state deals with them and... Mm -hmm. That's kind of been my experience um, socially is through this process of, wow, this is something I've just discovered. I don't know what it is. I, I'm trying to figure this out. Um, and what I've seen is an experience is, no, we don't want to talk about that. We don't want to know about that at all. Um, you know, this is not okay. And we're not going to have anything to do with you now. And that's been a very painful process. Um, you know, and I'm just trying to figure this out myself, but. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That sounds incredibly painful. Yeah. I had this picture of this world, you know, this structure that you were living in and everything was going in a certain way. And then you just kind of like tore into is it's the image that you just tore the side of the earth. (laughs) Like it was actually, it was actually this little like (laughs) magazine cut out earth that you like tore through. (laughs) And everyone was like, no, close that up, Terry. (laughs) Like, okay, if you're not going to close it up, you get out. (laughs) And we'll close it up around you. But don't you see there's this whole world. (laughs) So this is so interesting to me because for me, understanding and exploring polyamory um, and who I am in it or what it is to me or wh- who am I in my relationships mm-hmm. and accepting that along the way, also insecurities and fears, struggles at times. But I feel like my experience is so right. different from yours. You know, you have a long established mm-hmm. um, relationship with mm-hmm. your husband and then you discover right. this. So that's not the context in which I discovered it. Mm-hmm. 
necessarily. I mean, I was in a relationship and I thought, mm-hmm. hey, this is interesting to me. And actually, the person I was dating at the time said, right. yeah, that's interesting to me too. You know, but I, as I look back, there were a couple of other times mm-hmm. before that that the idea popped in or somehow I would just be intrigued about it and think, right. okay, I'm going to go to this meeting about it or, oh, I just want to learn about it. And then if I brought it up, someone mm-hmm. around me might be like, oh, that's that. I don't right. understand why you would want that, you know? So there would be some sort of like resistance or judgment. Mm-hmm. But where I truly got to explore it was in a relationship actually that I met someone at a polyamory ethical non-monogamy meetup. Mm-hmm. So we got to continue to explore right. both of our own ways and what we both wanted or what felt right to us in that relationship. And it was very safe to do that. So for you, yeah, it seems like you're coming up against all the structures that, you know, secure life in a certain way and going outside of that. Very much so. Yeah. And yeah, and, and not meaning to. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And it, like how brave yeah. of you to say, wow, I think there's this thing <laughs> happening for me, you know, within it. Right. And to be so open about it, because in a lot of ways, I wasn't open about it. I was with my family. Mm-hmm. And and my friends, so I guess there was that, but it just seems so much bigger that you had your husband right. and the whole structure around that. And it was, and you know, at, you know, when when it came to this relation, and this is just very, in a very just small seedling of a beginning where I realized, wow, I have this capacity to love someone else, and, and it wasn't, it was. Not in any way the sense of, oh, I've always loved this person all my life and, you know, and I love my husband or I chose my husband when, you know, I've always loved you. It it was nothing like that. It was very much this aha moment of, oh, this, this experience within me exists as well. And I didn't realize it, um, or that I was capable of it. And it was absolutely terrifying. Um, I think for about two days after that, I, I just cried. And it wasn't for the disclosure. It was for, this is going to change everything. And just the mourning and the sense of, man, this this is opening things up that I never knew existed. Yeah, this is huge. This is a paradigm shift. And you know, with the dynamics with my husband and just knowing him so well, I was like, this and fearing like I don't know how he's going to handle this um and I did walk through this very rose color glasses I still do (laughs) they're tinted (laughs) but um I really did come from a place of you know hey I just discovered this feeling let's talk about it let's figure (laughs) out what this means um worst case scenario is you know we all talk about what it means that I have feelings for this friend that I've always, you know, have cared about. He has feelings for me. So worst case scenario is we're going to have some really awkward get togethers. <laughs> you know, we're, you know, Hey, this is my friend. Oh, by the way, yeah. Uh, hey, we've got deeper feelings, but that, and I thought that was the worst of it. I thought we could really navigate this in a way of, Hey, there's this quirky tidbit about our friendship <laughs> that, we didn't expect, but that it wouldn't go anywhere. And that's where the idea mm-hmm. of Polly's kind of split in my mind from the ability and concept versus the practice of it um, mm-hmm. that I was wanting to explore and talk about, wow, this concept of holding more than one person in my heart and in my mind um, versus, hey, I want to engage, mm-hmm. change the dynamic and the structure of our relationships and how we interact with each other. Um, that didn't enter my mind at all until it started to come up as, Hey, this is also a thing. And in the early stages, I very much was having a lot of difficulty Mm -hmm. articulating what I was experiencing because I I hadn't read anything. I, at that point, it was the first week I hadn't even spoken to my therapist. Um, 
I knew of polyamory as a practice because I had some clients who were polyamorous, but they were coming in for depression. It, what, we weren't talking about their relationships um, or they're coming in for med management, stuff like that. Um, so I was not poly informed. Um, if anything, poly friendly as, in, as I was inclusive and yes, let me gain some competency in this if, if this were to come up in session, but no way did I know the ins and outs. If I did this, would <laughs> this all would have looked very different, <laughs> but, uh, um, but more of, yes, I know of this. I know this is how some relationships are and it's wonderful. And it's inclusive. And yes, you're not going to be judged here in this space. That's the extent of my knowledge of that. Um, so for me trying to just ex express to my husband and you know, how, how this is possible, I would say, you know, it's almost as if, you know, my heart is, is like a, is like a pie, but it's not, it's not like I give you a slice and I give him a slice and I give other people slices and then it's gone. It's not ratio. It's not percentage. It's just love. Like I'm, I keep saying my heart's not a pie. <laughs> he would look at me like, I don't know what this means. Um, and just feeling that. Yeah. It's, I see it time and time again, right. That, um, it's the sense that there's more space in your heart and, and, the, and it, not just that, it's not like you have to make the space. It already is there. You had the capacity, the feeling was already there. Mm -hmm. And then you had another feeling for someone else that may be similar, may be different, has its own flavor. Right. Um, but those, both of those feelings were in you and they existed together, whether you acknowledged them or not, it sounds like. And I have, mm -hmm. I have found the same thing, especially, you know, the interesting thing is I've been exploring this with family constellations work and um, where the crossover lives is in within mm -hmm. monogamous constructs. A lot of times people have come in with, I don't understand why my relationship is X, Y, and Z. You know, there's this problem in it. Uh, maybe someone's unfaithful. Maybe there's something we don't know. And then it reveals itself that somewhere in mm -hmm. the lineage of this person that maybe their father also had another wife or they had the first love. Mm -hmm. There was like heartbreak or they never got over somebody. And or maybe there was just a first partner and then mm -hmm. a second partner and they didn't quite honor that. And if you line all the people up and just have everyone acknowledge this person came mm -hmm. first, this person came second, or this person has a place in my heart and then this person has a place in my heart too. Then as the feelings move, then everyone arrives at peace an acknowledgement of everything that's there, the complexity that is there. And it sounds a lot like what's revealing in you or what has been in that acknowledgement. And yet there, there are uncomfortable spaces where it's, it's still in progress. Still. Yeah. And it's, yeah. Which is how life is. <laughs> right. And I, I'll actually, I, <laughs> I'll actually yeah. say that with folks when they ask me, Hey, how you doing? I'm like, I'm in progress. <laughs> True. <laughs> My loading <laughs> bar is still at halfway. <laughs> but loading um, bar, yeah. But it's, it's amazing you say that because I'd come to a a, a point of realization, and, it, and I haven't explored it yet um, about my family. It, it's kind of it's not necessarily common knowledge, but it's known that my my grandmother, whom apparently I, I take after a lot, um, I only was with her for about three or four years of my life um, or she was in my life for three or four years. So I really didn't get to know her. Um, but from what I understand, uh, my grandparents are 20 year difference. Um, so they're, you know, this generation gap, but back in the day that wasn't a big deal. <laughs> but um, I went through this period um, with my mom, mm -hmm. who's the youngest of her siblings, where she had separated from my grandfather multiple times. Um, she was very much a very strong and independent woman. She was, um, you know, she worked in World War II. She was one of the Rosie the Riveters. 
after that, she um, wanted to own her own tailor shop. She was a seamstress, so my grandfather helped fund that. So she ran her own um, tailor shop. Then she wanted to be a cosme- uh, cosmetologist, and so she had her own beauty shop. Like she, she was very self-determined and had a lot of self-agency. And at this point, um, at some point, she 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 left. She she moved out of state. She worked um, at an Air Force base at, as a seamstress. And from what I understand, she had multiple relationships while still being married. And from what I can understand from stories is that she still very much loved my grandfather. She just wanted more um, is how it's been framed. She wanted more out of life and they couldn't understand that, especially back then. That was mm, in the wow. 50s and 60s. Yeah. Way to be a trailblazer, Grandma. My God. Yeah. I <laughs> know. <laughs> uh, she was total pariah. <laughs> and, you know, I'm also hearing it from the lens of my aunts and uncles, my mom, who um, she was the youngest. Everyone else had been grown and out of the house. So she, she witnessed this firsthand. And, you know, it's colored through their own understandings. But my grandfather being very understanding and loving um, about this. And the reason why I say that is because my mom couldn't understand why isn't he getting angry? Why isn't he yelling? Why isn't he doing these things? Um, she even brought one of her, um, her partners to the, to back home and they met and they had, I think they had coffee or something you know, like that. And my mom's just floored, like, how can this happen? And I was driving down the highway just a few months ago and that that story, that narrative clicked in my head. And I was like, holy shit. Whoa. It was my grandmother. (laughs) And I I called my mom. That is incredible. She just did. Yeah. Well, she didn't need a name for it. She just did her thing (laughs) and loved where she loved. It sounds like. (laughs) Loved who he loved. And um, eventually, you know, she she came back home and and loved my grandmother and and was happily married. She, She just did that um and she was mm-hmm. the type of person who mm-hmm. did not it wasn't in an aggressive sense but she didn't answer to anyone she was very much answered to herself and her own conscience and yeah I, I literally just driving not thinking about anything and that popped up and I was like oh my god this was in my family so when you mentioned that I was like I really need to explore this a little bit more yeah, um, that's huge and I called my mom I was like I think I'm following my grandmother's footsteps <laughs> Without wow. meaning to. Oh, wow. What did she say? Well, my <laughs> yeah. mom's so loving and supportive. She's like, oh, I know, because she always wanted you to grow and do I'm like, no, no, no that's not what I met, mom. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Let me tell you exactly what I mean. <laughs> I, what I mean. <laughs> but yeah. Oh, wow. That's incredible. You know, I don't, I don't have a story like that. And being from a Chinese family, if I did, it might be very, very, very hidden. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't doubt that there's probably s- some, someone back there that lived that life and then many that probably felt right. it, but closed it down or whatever they did with it. But um, the story that I have is that and it it's something it's not really a poly story in a way but when i was dating that one person that i felt okay maybe mm-hmm. i do maybe that is me that i have the capacity to love many people and i couldn't get over this one boyfriend i had had mm-hmm. early on and by that point it had been like 8 years and somehow there was still something. And I, right. at the time, I kind of just chalked it up to, oh, you're just not over it. There's just something you need to feel mm-hmm. about this or no, or what is it? Or it's some sort of soul karma, whatever. But um, what I realized as I, at that point, mm-hmm. worked on that layer was that I did love him still. And even though we, you know, hadn't talked mm-hmm. for, I don't know, a couple of years or a year or that we weren't going to choose being with each other, I still loved him. And when I accepted that in myself, it was like my body had this sigh of relief. Mm-hmm. But then I couldn't tell my partner at the time. And I just felt like it would be threatening in right. some way or it would be it would it would be too chaotic. It would, it would bring stuff I didn't want to deal with. 
And so I kept that in. Then I went another level deeper and went to the ancestry. And, and I thought, mm-hmm. why is this something in me that is a sort of energetic dynamic that has another context that I've just inherited and I've repeated myself, you know? And I remember my mom telling me that when I was, uh, she was pregnant with me, she had left Hong Kong a couple of years prior to that and left this man that she really loved. And because they immigrated, she just had to leave. So that that relationship was disrupted and they just never continued it. And back then, you know, we didn't have very, I I don't think we had email, you know? (laughs) And phone. Was, yeah. I was like, wait a minute, just checking. Yeah, we didn't no, have email. No social media. <laughs> we didn't have any. Right. We, we had this thing Skype. called paper. <laughs> yeah. So she just had to let it go. Paper mail. Uh huh. <laughs> paper mail. <laughs> Snail mail. <laughs> yeah. So that was just cut off. And she would go mm. while she was pregnant with me and go to the park and cry over this loss like daily. And Mm -hmm. she never really, to the day she told me when I was in high school or something, she Mm -hmm. never really felt like she completed or resolved Mm -hmm. or like had closure with it and still felt like she loved him and was dreaming about him and everything. Mm -hmm. And then I realized, whoa, you know, there's this acknowledgement of this love that she couldn't quite fully have, actually, because that was truly threatening to my father. Mm-hmm. in their relationship in the in the belief sets and constructs and structures that they had lived with and created and culturally took on mm-hmm. so i realized that i could just picture her acknowledging him right and my father and that gave me something more for myself and that she already had the capacity to love two people right and it also gave me some sense of, oh, I don't have to hide this anymore. Even though she hid it because of her reasons, I don't have to hide something like that. And I can do what I want with it. So that really did actually release me Mm -hmm. in a lot of ways. But also that relationship that I'm talking about that I felt so in love with this this guy, Mm -hmm. um, that also began to dissolve and just change and move. And it's not someone that's particularly... I would say I love right now and they're just so far away from my life, but I feel at peace with the fact that that was Mm -hmm. the way I experienced it back then. So it's so interesting to hear your story because I believe there are so many people out there that live this life. Right. And there are so many judgments Mm -hmm. and um, yeah, friction against the, I guess, what's socially accepted. And I'm careful to say acceptable because I think it's quite normal to have many different feelings for different people. It it is. And in a a simple way of kind of thinking about it, it's like, you know, what what is determined to be socially acceptable in, in certain outlets where, you know, it's acceptable in some ways to have a mistress or to have a, a side piece or, you know, to have, mm. you know, multiple affairs, you know, even though we don't accept it as, hey, this is okay, but it's like, this isn't unusual. No one's freaking out <laughs> over the sense of like, how could anyone do this? Because no one has ever mm-hmm. done this before. Um, but it's more of, yes, we know that this is in the realm of deviancy that we're aware of. But when it comes to polyamory, this is like, no, we, we don't even accept that as being possible um, or understandable where we may have a little bit more tolerance for if someone, you know, cheats or if someone, you know, is a serial monogamist, um, where we can't hold the concept of, you know, someone can, you know, love more than one person, but essentially you do. If you had one relationship, you end that one, you have another one and you have another one. It's like, wow, you are, you are capable of loving so many people <laughs> throughout your lifetime. Um, you know, it's possible to also love them concurrently, 
And, and, and we see that, you know, I'm still in love with my ex or, you know, I'm still in love with my, you know, first, you know, boyfriend or girlfriend, uh, you know, right. that's true. We still hold that in many ways, but yeah. this is labeling it in a way that some folks are just not comfortable. And I know for, for a while I wasn't either. Well, it brings up the, um, the phrase or the concept of emotional cheating to me as you're describing that i was like oh yeah like serial monogamy like i've i've been accused of even just having some like sexual and emotional interaction with someone right after breaking up with another person i mean a couple of weeks or something right right that there's this what i was accused of was mm-hmm. oh you were emotionally cheating on me before that because mm-hmm. obviously your relationship with this person was already here while we were dating so you must have been doing that. Right. And it's like, well, depends yeah. how you look at it. <laughs> but but probably because I wasn't so open and honest about it that, okay, I can, I can see that that's understandable. But had I been more open and honest about it, that might have been a different story. That might have just been more like, oh, you are Polly. And, and that's where, you know, I know my... My therapist keeps, uh, you know, because me and my husband are both in our individual and we're both in couples therapy um, to try mm-hmm. and figure this out, but really to try and regulate um, through all of this. But um, what's been reiterated through throughout the whole thing is, you know, this could have been kept secret. You know, be, being honest was the most painful piece. Um, and, and it was because I, I knew within those first couple of days, like this is going to change everything. Even if it meant, Hey, I'm never talking to my friend again, or, you know, Hey, we're, we're, we're just going to keep it, um, you know, superficial. Or we're not going to you know explore anything, but even just the, the concept of I can love someone else or, you know, for my husband, like, you know, her heart doesn't belong just to me. And it's very much, you know, an ownership and possessiveness, um, type, you know, insecurity start coming up. You know, what does it mean to be in a relationship? What does it mean to, you know, marriage aside, but pledge yourself mm-hmm. to someone? You know, what does it mean to take vows? You know, what does it mean to have, you know, emotions for someone else? Is that emotional infidelity? Even if it's completely without one's own doing. Um, all of these questions start coming up. Um and that's why I say it's not for the weak hearted because it's they're constant. And at least in my experience, you know, you, one question pops up, you know, having the the willingness and tenacity in a lot of ways to explore and understand how that that issue or that question and what it means. And then, oh, it unlocks something else. And so now you have this door to go through and then it's all interconnected and it can be so overwhelming and just so... Mm-hmm complex to oh, yeah. remember to pace and, and take a breath and say, you know, it's, it's okay if I don't know everything because I just don't or understand why I'm feeling what I'm feeling or, mm-hmm. you know, explain how this can happen. It just goes back to what you were saying earlier. It's like, can I just hold it again? Is that constant back and forth? Yeah. And I know what you mean about one thing unlocking the next and then, you know, multiple questions coming out of one thought or experience or discovery and unearthing, you know, and so much of it is not something we decide about who we are, but what we experience and it already is. And so it does sound like you're deconstructing all of the structures that held something in place and held relationships in a in a certain framework mm-hmm. that then you're asking questions like you know I don't know if you're asking these questions but I was asking questions like well what is marriage to me not to everyone else but what has it been and then what is commitment then if I'm committed to a partner or two or th- you know three or whatever it is what does that mean In this relationship, what does that mean as a whole? Do I want commitment? And I think that a lot of times commitment has meant we stay together and we put the relationship first. And for me, it's really changed that the commitment is my commitment to myself 
and expressing myself as I am and being true and honest and honoring of that, as well as someone else's own self-discovery and their growth and who they are to themselves. And that that commitment is first and then the relationship comes second. So how have you, what kinds of questions have you dug into? Uh, wow. What, um, oh, what, <laughs> so many, so many. What does it mean to be open and honest? Um, what does it mean to be transparent? Mm. Um, I've been accused of being too truthful to a fault. <laughs> <laughs> was it sort of like um, that hurt my feelings? You should have kept that in kind of context or what does it mean? More like <laughs> more of, we don't have to talk about everything. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, I don't want to know about everything. Exactly. Exactly. Which, you know, yeah. is, is said jokingly. And at the same time, there's, you know, there's a, some truth and some pain to that because, you know, I do, hey, we're in the profession of talking. <laughs> I love doing it so much. I found a way to get paid for it um, and asking questions. I, uh, you know, but yeah. yeah, just what does it mean to to hold truth? Um, the expectations of that, how it differs from other people. The question of, in a lot of, in a lot of ways, and I don't want to just generalize it to boundaries, but um, what are limits, you know, balancing what is the limit that I have for others? What is the limit I have for myself? What is my emotional limit? Um, knowing that our emotions are boundless, but at what point do I start protecting myself and saying, I need to have this boundary for my health, for my sake, and knowing that um, that may disrupt a lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, being okay with stating needs and and what is wanted or desired without um, without the fear that it's going to you know this word that comes to mind is you know it's going to break everything apart um, because that goes back to the honesty is like I can't hold in anymore. Um, my superpower of repression is gone. So, um, you know, I need to be able to talk. I need to be able to process and knowing that not everybody else is, and that's okay. Um, now the question that, that I'm facing now and, you know, I'm processing as I go is, mm. oh, how much of decisions and choices do I make for, myself for a relationship um you know for even my husband um or in in the service for him you know how do i find a balance of that and it, it's it's tough it's tough because you know a lot of times we talk about you know being self-aware and understanding our motives but then there's so many layers to it um you know is this a choice out of love is this a choice out of you know, willingness to be vulnerable. Is this a choice out of hope? Is this a choice out of um, an expectation? <laughs> Is this a choice out of you know, wanting to change circumstances and it's just a form of control? I mean, all of these questions and at some point it's just like, man, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I just want to be able to, to make choices like I used to, <sighs> which it, it didn't take so much mental energy. <laughs> and, and yet you cannot ignore all that, that all that's here it sounds like yeah. and then i can't yeah yeah i want to go back to making a choice of like do i want a vanilla or mocha latte rather than okay well what happened in my oh childhood my <laughs> to bring this insecurity or this need up and you know i'm feeling this and is this from me is this from you is this the past is this oh yeah it can be so overwhelming at times as opposed repression to repression has its advantages right, I need to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah. yeah. And disadvantages, it can really bite. Oh, yeah. Because you're on yeah. the path of really knowing yourself in, a, in mm -hmm. an extremely deep and profound way daily. Right. And arriving at more every look you get, it sounds like, and even when you're not <laughs> looking. Like, oh, good, that came up. Yeah. You know, through, 
you know, because I know that my experience has been, is different from a lot of folks. But, um, the reality of losing a lot of friends, close friends, um, friendships that I've, I've had for years and um, had a very big bond with to, to the point of it changed my decision of whether or not I was going to accept a job in another state. Close knit married couples. I mean, we think about it as like we're, we're hanging out one, two times a week. Um, we're very, um, very close. I considered one of them to be like, like a sibling to me. And you know, just having that question of, you know, is it possible to love more than one person? You know, the question of, wow, is it possible to hold more than one person in your heart? Um, I, I know just even though we didn't even talk about it, that's the crazy thing is, this was a conversation of what is going on. Like, why are you asking these questions? It was just unspoken. Mm -hmm. But I would I imagine this brought up a lot of insecurities. Um, I knew oh, one wow. of one of our friends, um, newly newly married, like within a few months of us. Um, the other couple um, been married for years, but then they've been having mm. very rough time. Um, mm -hmm. And the question of divorce had even popped up. So I know this whole exploration of, hey, guys, guess what I just discovered <laughs> was <laughs> was too much of a threat, too much. I mean, for my husband, for our relationship, for them, for, for a lot of people. Um, and I think I did walk through this very much like that panda of just not really realizing the the depth and the, the level of fear that it would bring up in, in many people, including myself. Um, but really thinking, hey, we can talk about this. And it, and it was a naive standpoint um, in a lot of ways. But I think it was just the innocence that I had of, hey, I found, I found out this part of me. I want to share it with my husband because we just made a lasting commitment. We Hey, we've been together for 17 years and we've been through so much. Let's talk about this. Figure this out. Let's see. You know, here's our friend also of 17 years. We know him so well. And so you know, let's figure out this dynamic. Is this mm -hmm. weird and strange? And yeah, let's, let's, let's try and move forward and how we can understand each other. And if it's going to be awkward at social gatherings, okay, now we're prepared for it, but mm -hmm. that would be it. Um, I did not expect the the life and world changing dynamics that would happen after. That's that. huge. It is huge, and it's not necessarily a negative thing. I I, I try to avoid judgments and labels like that, but it's yeah, it's definitely been an incredible experience. Incredibly wonderful in many ways. Discovering parts of myself and parts of my relationship, both with my husband and also with my friend. Um, it's been very painful in the same respects, uh, recognizing insecurities that I've had since childhood, recognizing the insecurities in my husband that I knew were there, um, but I didn't realize the depth of it, um, unfortunately, and, and at the same time, fortunately, it's, it's unlocked a, a lot of childhood traumas for him, no idea, he didn't either, and so balancing that growth as well. Um, yeah, yeah, it's definitely been a whirlwind, but, but also seeing how they're all interconnected in some mm -hmm. way, how we think of ourselves, how we think of ourselves in relationships, um, how relationships function for us in many ways or how we expect them to. Right. And we're, I mean, it's not the easiest thing to look at where we're using our relationships in certain ways for right control or mm -hmm. keeping certain parts of us remaining repressed so that we don't have to feel them but we it's there S societally it's there it's in individuals it's in me you know and in it sounds like you're unearthing those <laughs> like <laughs> excavation style <laughs> yeah and not only did i pull the curtain and see that hey there's a man behind the curtain but it's like you said i'm e excavating uh -huh. a lot of a lot of stuff and um yeah i mean we we often judge something like like that like hey we use our relationships but 
but taking the judgment away is like they all function. You know, hey, I have this mentor relationship. You know, I use this person for for guidance as you know a, a mentor, as someone I can confide in who knows the ropes and can show that to me. You know, I use this relationship um you know with my girlfriend you know hey we both like hallmark movies and lifetime and we like to you know just relax and have a good time and i can't do that with this other person because you know that relationship functions differently if we take the labels around you know off of it each person reveals a part of ourselves and each relationship does as well no, I, we're not going to necessarily act the same way in every single relationship. You know, I'm not going to talk to my teacher the same way I would talk to my brother. You know, we do we do tend to judge that, and so but just asking, how is this relationship functioning, and how do I function within it, can be a very scary one. Yeah, and and how do you like what level of attachment is that, or what level of um, in terms of like clinging on that this is something you know and there are various times we need things but to what extent is something that is a really tight grip versus um being in it wholeheartedly and seeing freedom in both and allowing what capacity can we feel that and be with it what capacity can we notice when we are gripping and what that experience is and what what that unearths. There's so, there's so much here. I feel like we could talk forever about this. Mm -hmm. And I wonder, Terry, if you'd want to come back again and talk more about kind right. of the nitty gritty, you know, like the questions, the insecurities right. that come up and what you've discovered. I just have so many curiosities mm -hmm. about that. And I have my own experiences to share. Um, would you like to do that another time? Mm hmm. Awesome. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can do that. Like you said, there's so much we can even make it more thematic. <laughs> yeah. Oh, gosh, that would be cool, you know, to check in with where you're at with everything on the process. Yeah, we could focus on a certain thing that way. Um, yeah, because it is, it is, it's all so interconnected. And there's part of me that's like, I feel like a newborn where I'm like, wow, <laughs> or even a toddler, like, what's this? I'm going to put this in my mouth and I'm going to you know, chew on this and discover this. And, so much. And everyone's saying, no, 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 no. <laughs> 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 Don't do that. <laughs> 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 not that oh. much. Don't do or like not that much <laughs> or like you don't do that in public. <laughs> exactly. We don't talk about these things here. <laughs> what, right. <laughs> Oh, gosh, I, I totally get that. So maybe today, if we just close with a piece of what has been, I almost mm. want to say reward, but not, like what has been the parts of your learning that you've mm. really enjoyed or your parts, of, the parts of the experience of this that has been fruitful for you? Two things come to mind. Um, for me, it has been able to really experience and understand what it means to love fully and wholeheartedly. And having that experience of truth and authenticity and, and just saying that and and feeling no resistance is like I can love fully with my entire heart and my entire being for more than one person and it not be a contradictory, you know, contradictory statement. Um, and just kind of sitting within that truth, mm -hmm. um, recognizing and learning different parts of myself that I never realized before. Um, and so this has been a very, personal journey of self-discovery even if it's without a partner or my husband or with anyone it's just enjoying in a lot of ways the different parts of myself that I never knew existed and that have been covered up or hidden or you know in the darkness and and just having that curiosity the second piece and this kind of informs my practice well it kind of really does just the empathy of, you know, how we can be in so much pain and we can suffer 
and we may try our best and just being able to give ourselves permission to just be where we're at and, and say it's okay and to know that we're all just looking for for love and for security and to be ourselves and to to love fully who we are in other people you know i think of like the divine child you know before we were all wounded you know i can see more more empathically you know how often we're hurt and how often we we just hide ourselves and we create these rules and these structures and these you know mm-hmm. a lot of rigid things to keep us together when um just kind of seeing who we are and where we are and, and why the insecurities are there. I think that's been very helpful for me um, and just being able to sit and be present with my, with my clients, just be, just hold them in that sense. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you Thank for you. sharing. Thank you for having me. Mm. Oh my gosh, this is so fun. Yeah. I feel like we could talk endlessly and, you know, as you're, <laughs> as you are, talking about some of those doors I'm telling you about. Oh my gosh, yeah. (laughs) Well, you know, something I didn't mention through this, like my experience Mm -hmm. wasn't, is it as a whole, wasn't just easy, 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 right? There were times Mm -hmm. where it was easier, but I do just want to mention today that some of the struggles I've had have been similar in a way, but by far not Mm -hmm. because I may, what I'm referring to is um, new relationships that I approached during the time I was exploring whether this was me, like what was me? Or, you know, there was a time I thought maybe right. it's just a time period that I'd want to experience mm-hmm. my life in practice in a polyamorous way, if not always mm-hmm. acknowledge my capacity, right? right. My, my feelings, but maybe right. it'll pass that I just will be more monogamous right. in a sense in function. (laughs) And then I would try that out. (laughs) I would try that out. And, and I would explain to that person, well, I do have all sorts of feelings for all sorts of people. In fact, there are, you know, there are still these people that I do love and we have this kind of relationship that is more than just friends. Right. And yet it isn't like a full on relationship. So are you okay with that? Mm -hmm. So I'd be up front but then somehow mm-hmm. the relationship would start turning monogamous and it, I could feel the energy like tightening up right. around that and the feeling of um, that it needs to be that way mm-hmm. for this to work. And then I would have to come out of that and realize, wow, I feel trapped. This actually doesn't work for me and right. would have to be incredibly, it, it, the honesty felt like I had to like break through those rigid layers with my words and it was, it didn't get met up with judgment, but it did end up eventually with me mm-hmm. breaking up those relationships right. because I could see mm-hmm. ultimately deep down that it wasn't truly right for yeah. the other person, though they tried to make it work. So it was almost the other way around. I could see in them that mm-hmm. they were trying to live a polyamorous way, but they were in their heart at that moment felt monogamy was more suitable for for who they were and what what they wanted to experience Mm -hmm. so it did break things apart Mm -hmm. and i think that that's um part of the insecurities that i would have to look at in those places of what kind of trust do i have for Mm -hmm. myself in my life you know do i am i attaching to this right well it felt like a split like am i can I be myself here and have this relationship? Not really. So I either, I, I in some way have to compromise my being. So if I'm really going to love myself fully, then I have to let go. So I've had struggles too, but they're nowhere near. <laughs> it sounds like the, the amount of pain that you're experiencing in so many places. But those are big questions too, you know, and they it can bring a lot of, of pain and loss too. And I think the the pain that I'm experiencing now is just it's been so consecutive and it's kind of was not prepared for any of this. Um, you know, it'd be one mm-hmm. thing if this was something that was introduced um, 
mutually or even like, hey, this is something you know, this is something I'm wanting in a relationship or it's something I've been thinking about. It was more of I have to figure out why this is happening. <laughs> hey, I, I've heard it's of like this knocking before. on your door. <laughs> right. <laughs> um and there's been plenty of times I've said in therapy, it's like I didn't want this. I wasn't looking for this. I didn't I don't want it now. Like if there was a way to cut this out of me, I would like you know, the the this the reality of even mourning the friendship that I had. Like we can never go back to the friendship we had, even if we weren't to pursue anything. It's like that's gone. It's like uh, I didn't want any of this, and I know for my husband, absolutely not. Um, not even just acknowledgement, but it's it is what it is. Like it's here, and so it's very much been haphazard. Like. Oh, I found this other door and it's okay. I'm going to open it. I'm ready to walk mm-hmm. through it. And the pain that comes with is, you know, folks not wanting me to, uh, wanting me to keep quiet. Mm. Yeah. Well, this loops me back to grad school because I remember someone told me this and I thought, okay, yeah, that kind of makes sense. But it's, it's vastly different course, but <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to bring a little light at the moment. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not that it needs to be covered over by it or anything. Oh, no, but you're fine. Just, just the idea that like when you, when something comes knocking on your door and you are like, mm-hmm. it's like, what is that? And I can't ignore it. And I don't really want that, but it's here. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the people around yeah. you are forced to take the ride. Right. Because you can't ignore this. And it, Reminds me of grad school in that way. You, you <laughs> are, when we were on the ride of grad school. Yeah, without yeah, seatbelts. The people around us are like, Jesus, I did not want to do this. <laughs> you know what? And it's funny you mentioned it because I've often, throughout this year, I've been thinking about grad school more than anything else and not like, oh, those were the days. That's but funny. it's like, oh my God. No. Oh, no. <laughs> it's, it's been like <laughs> this feel, it's very, it's very similar feeling. And I'm glad you mentioned that because, yeah the people around us were not prepared for us to be learning and discovering not just about, you know, human behavior, but just ourselves and the personal work that was involved. I mean, I remember a lot of Mm -hmm. folks, we were encouraged to go to our personal therapy and students saying, I'm not doing that, but (laughs) how much we needed to, but because, you know, I lost a lot, a lot of friends. Yeah. Um, throughout grad school of, of friends that I knew back home um, because I thought differently. Yeah. It was like, Oh, Terry went away, mm. came back a totally different person. And it wasn't like oh, overnight, yeah. but just questions, you know, my Facebook feed started changing. <laughs> you know, The things I would post about and talk about were different and yeah. And they were not prepared for it. They didn't sign up for that. Yeah. And I, I think you're bringing up something that's uh, that I didn't realize along the pathway is that, you know, the more life that I embrace in myself and the more I open up myself, there are deaths somewhere. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, those losses and there are things that end and mm-hmm. it's just not something we're always prepared for or want. You know, there are certain things we want to hold on to. But, right. Yeah. Thank you so much for talking with me and sharing all these different parts of your story. It's incredible what you're doing and incredible in the, in terms of just your willingness to look mm-hmm. and also not look at times where you need to put right. boundaries or take a break and just accept that as a part of the ride. Thank you. Well, thank you for having me and thank you for the opportunity as well. And, you know, your podcast have been very helpful for me. I, I know my clients absolutely enjoy them. They love your therapy voice. <laughs> um, but yes, it's been great. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. That's so sweet. Yeah. Sometimes people are like, are you really Zen? Because your voice, and I'm like, no, like that's, I'm a human being. <laughs> They're like, can I curse around you? Because you just sound like so calm all the time. And I'm like, no, I'm not calm all the time. <laughs> <laughs> right. And I'm fine with cursing. That's fine. <laughs> but thank you so much. It's absolutely. And okay. It's such a pleasure. <laughs> yes. Yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. Well, look, I'll look forward to having you again um, next time. And well, thank you. Oh, until then, just wishing you lots of 
hugs for yourself along the ride of this this adventure. Yes. Thank you. And always remembering to be kind and gentle. Awesome. Oh, yes. <laughs> yes, please. More doses <laughs> of that. Oh, yes. All, every day, all day. Every day, all day. Thanks so much for joining us today. And it's so great to have you, Terry, on the show. I hope that you all found this very intriguing, interesting, maybe even learned something about yourself. I definitely did while we had our conversation and the ones that were um, prefacing it that were not on air. And don't forget that Terry has a meditation coming up for deep breathing and gentle body scanning and a progressive muscle tension and relaxation process to open your awareness. Check that out at CandiceWu.com slash Terry or wait for drop into your uh, wherever your platform is that you listen to podcasts later this week. Also, if you're interested in some resources on polyamory, uh, Terry has offered several of those and those are listed on um, the show notes as well. And just to drop in the names of the books that she mentioned, More Than Two, A Practical Guide to Ethical Polyamory, The Ethical Slut, A Practical Guide to Polyamory, Open Relationship and Other Adventures, which is a pretty common one, and Opening Up, A Guide to Creating and Sustaining Open Relationships. Well, it's great to have you here and I hope you're all out there doing well and uh, staying healthy in your own way. And if you're not, that you're finding what you need through this time, as well as taking the time to go into deeper healing if that opportunity arises for you and being present with yourself with whatever you feel. Well, that's all for today. So I look forward to seeing you next time on the Embody Podcast.